take that test and change it. Turn and face the strain. Hello, everybody. Seemed appropriate to play a little bit of David Bowie changes for you as we start to talk about this idea up here, phase diagrams. So what we're going to do is I'll go through and I'll explain a little bit about what basically phase diagrams are and then we'll get into some of the details of the information you can get out of phase diagrams. So all phase diagrams have the same set of axes regardless of what you're looking at, what material you're looking at. All phase diagrams will have pressure on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis. What a phase diagram simply does is it coordinates, it maps out what phases are present at the different pressure and temperature combinations. It's pretty straightforward, right? So this is sort of a, a map of the phases. I am showing you, of course, to start with what do we always do in introductory chemistry courses is we tend to explain things using water. And so I've got up here the phase diagram for water. So we've got the pressure in, uh, looks like uh, that's in, uh, what unit is that in? It's kind of off to the side there. There we go. It looks like it's in uh, Pascals versus uh, temperature in Celsius here. All right, so let's point out a few of the first obvious aspects. So at lower temperatures, so farther off on the left of the temperature axis, and at fairly you know, moderate to high pressures, we're going to have the solid phase. All right, That's what we've got here. Okay, I'll put a little S for solid. Of course, we have ice. At higher temperatures and uh, fairly lower pressures, we're going to have the gas phase okay, or the vapor phase. And then in between those two, we will, of course, have the liquid phase. Now, the phase diagram I found here uh, is apparently from uh, maybe a British uh, website. So, uh, you know, they don't know how to spell vapor for one thing. Um, and they use commas. I don't know if you can see those, but those are actually commas instead of decimal points. Silly British. But anyways, it, it works uh, good enough for our purposes. All right, what are the lines on a phase diagram? So I've got these different lines here. The lines represent the equilibrium position between the two or three phases that are touching that line. So for example, if you go to about 100 degrees and you go to about 1 atm, right there is the normal boiling point for water, right? Right there is where liquid water and water vapor are in equilibrium with each other. So that's our normal boiling point. This right here would be our normal melting point, right? We're at 1 atm, and this is the phase uh, equilibrium between solid and liquid. So right there, the system is in equilibrium as it goes from the solid to the liquid, okay? So that's what all these lines represent. They represent the different equilibria. So as we lower the pressure, you can see that the boiling point for water goes down. Right, that makes sense. We talked about this before. We've seen it in things like the clausius clapeyron relationships. We talked about, for example, in Denver, right? Denver is the mile high city. It has a lower atmospheric pressure. So water in Denver boils at a noticeably lower temperature. All right, so that takes care of the lines. Then we've got a couple of points we need to address on phase diagrams. The first point is this guy right here, and you can see that it is called a triple point it's pretty much what you might think it is. It is the unique temperature and pressure at which all three phases, solid, liquid, and gas, are present and in equilibrium, okay? Then we also have another point up here at the top of the phase diagram called the critical point, right? You can see there it's called the critical point. The critical point is something maybe you don't have a lot of experience with. You actually do for one material we're going to look at a little bit later, even though you may not realize you know the critical point for that material. We actually uh, will define it here. The critical point I like to define with respect to temperature. It seems to make the most sense for me. So the critical point is the temperature, and in this case the critical point um, is, oh boy, I'm going to have to look this up. Maybe we'll look it up for later. But the critical point, actually, there it is. Um, you can sort of see it. It's about 374 Kelvin. That is the temperature at which 
no amount of pressure, you can squeeze as hard as you want, there's no amount of pressure that will reliquify the material at that temperature. So when you get to about 374 Kelvin with water, you can squeeze that vapor as much as you want, you'll never get it to recondense. It's sort of the, the point of no return. Now, if you lower the temperature back below 374, you can then go ahead and, and, um, and recondense the vapor. But at 374 and higher, liquid water won't exist anymore, okay? So you'll always be in the vapor phase. Also, sometimes the material, when it's around the critical point, sometimes it's referred to as something called a supercritical fluid. Uh, you can have a supercritical fluid up here. Because it's a vapor, but it's under such high pressure that it can also have some flow properties like a liquid, so they call it a supercritical fluid. But for our purposes, we can simply treat it as being a vapor. All right? So now try to remind yourself of a few terms. If I go from solid to liquid, what do I do? Of course, that is melting. Liquid to solid is, of course, freezing. Liquid to gas, that is, of course, evaporation. Gas to liquid, condensation. How about solid right to gas? You probably know that one, right? That's called sublimation. And then, how about gas directly to solid? If you go right from the gas to the solid, that process, gas to solid, is called deposition. All right, so there are the, the six different phase change processes we could look at. Now, there's one thing I want to point out about the water phase diagram that is unique for water, and that is this line right here. All the other phase diagrams we're going to look at, their solid to liquid equilibrium line is sloped in the other direction. This guy here is sloping to the left as it goes up. Most other materials have a solid liquid line that slopes in the other direction. It goes towards the right as you increase in pressure. That is sort of a key feature, the slope of that line right there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in this other phase diagram here of water to illustrate what's going on. So I'll keep the first one up here so we can see it, but I'm going to bring in this sort of insert. What this is depicting, that um, what is that, a negative slope there? That negatively sloped solid to liquid line, what that is depicting is the unique thing that water does, right? Do you remember if you freeze water, right, it expands, okay? Liquid water, it turns out, is more dense than solid water. And the slope of this line actually depicts that. Think of it this way. Let's start right here. Okay, I'm going to start right there. I'm in the liquid phase at the top of this dashed line. If I were to start right there, okay, or better yet, I'm going to go the other way. Let's start here. I'm going to start in the solid phase where that X is. Now imagine starting at that solid and squeezing, isothermally squeezing. So I'm not going to change the temperature. I'm just going to increase the pressure. As we go up in pressure, you can see that we actually do a phase change. When you squeeze ice, it melts. Now, this might have some reason to do as to why ice skating works, right? You, you put pressure on the blade right on the surface of the ice, and maybe you're getting the first few molecular layers of the ice to melt, turns into liquid, and then the liquid on top of the solid makes for a slippery surface. So this might explain why ice skating works, okay? But again, the slope of that line is going to be somewhat unique to water, as we'll see when we look at some of the other phase diagrams. Okay, now let me go ahead and shrink up these two guys because I want to go and talk a little bit about some other phase diagrams. Here's the phase diagram for a material that we have some experience with. This is the phase diagram for carbon dioxide, CO2. Now, I like to point this one out because it has the very same sort of general shape as that first one for water. Solid at low temperatures and broad ranges of pressure, gases at high temperature and lower pressures, and liquid in between. Okay? Now, you can see here the triple point for CO2 is actually at a fairly high pressure, about 5 atm, but it's at a fairly low temperature, about negative 57 degrees Celsius. So there's the triple point. 
the critical point is up here, as you can see, the critical point is only about 31 degrees Celsius. So it's not too hard to get to the critical point for carbon dioxide. You take CO2, you get it to a measly 31 degrees Celsius, and the only thing you can have at that point, regardless of the pressure, is gaseous CO2. Now let's take a clo closer look at this diagram, and let's see if this sort of makes sense with our everyday experience. Where do we live on the phase diagram here, right? We're down here at 1 atm, and we're over here probably around 25-ish degrees Celsius, typically. So we live right around here on that phase diagram. So it makes sense that when we see CO2, or not see it, but when uh, we notice CO2, it tends to be a gas, right? We, we exhale it. So CO2 is a gas at our ambient temperatures and pressures. Now, what's the other form of CO2 you might have a little experience with? You know dry ice, right? Dry ice is solid CO2. And how do you make dry ice? Well, what you do is you take the CO2 gas that we have and you simply cool it down, right? And if you cool it down at our ambient one atmosphere pressure, if you cool it down, you see that you go through a deposition process. You go right from the gas to the solid. So you deposit CO2. All right, so that's why you uh, have some experience with dry ice. It's not that hard to make. You don't have to get it all that cold. And then you know what CO2 does, right? CO2 down here as dry ice, it sublimes. It goes right into the gas phase, okay? We'll come back to this issue of phase changes um, in a second when we look at one more phase diagram. All right, so that's carbon dioxide. Let me bring in one more phase diagram. This guy here. This is the phase diagram for carbon. A couple of things to point out here for carbon. Thing number one, right? Right here we have a triple point, okay? You see that we have solid and graphite form, liquid and vapor. So right there is a triple point for carbon. Now up here, some people might also refer to this as another triple point, but it's not truly a triple point in the sense that we have three unique phases. We actually have two of the same phases, we have diamond and graphite. What do you call it when you have the same phase but a different version of a material? Do you know that term? So diamond and graphite are two solid forms of carbon. So those are called allotropes, A-L-L-O-T-R-O-P-E, allotrope. So diamond and graphite are allotropes of solid carbon. So right there we see that diamond and graphite are in equilibrium with the liquid phase. Okay, so you can, I guess, call that a triple point, but by maybe the most vigorous definition of triple point, that is three phases. I don't know if we would technically call that guy a triple point, but it definitely has one, and maybe it sort of has two. Here's the other thing I want to point out about this phase diagram. Where do we live on this phase diagram? Well, we are at, so that's Pascal's there, so we live at about 101 kilopascals, so that's about 10 to the what, 10 to the fifth pascals, and we live at about, you know, 300 Kelvin. So we're down here in the corner um, of, this, uh, of this phase diagram, maybe a little bit higher, but close enough. So we live where graphite is the preferred form of carbon, and that makes sense. We see plenty of graphite, but, but, we also see diamond, right? When I got engaged to Mrs. Dr. Crane, I was able to give her a, well, a diamond ring. We'll call it a diamond ring. I was able to give her a diamond ring. But that diamond ring, right, that is only present up here at 10 to the 9 or higher pressures. So that diamond ring I gave Mrs. Dr. Crane should actually be graphite. So why is it that we're able to give our future wives diamonds? or current wives if you're trying to uh, stay married. Why are we able to have diamonds at all? Well, we have to keep in mind what kind of information a phase diagram gives us. This is a key idea. Phase diagrams give us thermodynamic information. They don't give us any information about kinetics. So, while it is true that graphite is the thermodynamically stable form of carbon at our temperature and pressure, 
diamond was formed in the Earth's crust at extreme temperatures and pressures, and it is true. My wife's diamond ring, which was made up here at some point, many, 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 many years ago, is working its way towards graphite. My wife's diamond ring is turning into, essentially, pencil lead. Now, the good news for me, and the good news for husbands everywhere, is this takes a really long time. So, diamond is kinetically stable, right? We've talked about kinetics and thermodynamics. It's kinetically stable. It's not going anywhere for a really long time. The activation barrier to that diamond to graphite conversion is really tall. So that conversion is really slow. But nonetheless, it is true. In the millennia it may take, eventually my wife's diamond ring will turn back into good old-fashioned graphite, good old-fashioned pencil lead. But that's the thing to keep in mind, is that phase diagrams are thermodynamic concepts. You have no idea how fast, say, that phase transition will take. It could go like that, or it could take thousands of years. You can't tell just by looking at the phase diagram. All right, so that's a little bit about the information we can get off of phase diagrams. Sorry the video was a little bit on the long side, but I wanted to put all of this stuff into one video because it does make kind of one neat little story. All right, so what would I ask you to do? Maybe I would ask you to interpret phase diagrams, understand what phase is present at a given temperature or pressure, um, and just kind of be able to, to develop and read these sorts of, of maps of different phases. All right, uh, that's it. I think that's actually the last video of new material for our unit on liquids and solids. All right, so let us have David Bowie take us out. There's gonna have to be a different man.